Hello, good morning, and welcome to Nature Live Online from the Natural History Museum. I'm Khalil Thurloway. While our doors still may be shut for the time being, we are hoping to reopen next month, we do still want to provide you with an inside peek at the science and the people that make the museum what it is. And I know that there are lots of really important conversations and actions going on around us right now, but that doesn't mean we should stop caring about our planet or the universe or the people around us at the same time. We'd love to hear from you guys at home as well. So if you've got any questions today, please do pop them in the comments section and we'll come to as many as we can in the time we've got. Today, we're gonna to be talking about Mars, not just the planet itself, but also our relationship with it in the past, the present and the future. To provide some insight into all our missions to Mars, I've got Sarah Matagian, who studies Mars and is actually working on a mission that you might find out a little bit more about later on. Hi, Sarah, thanks for joining us. Hey, Cleo. So, before we go into a little bit about Mars and some of the missions we've sent there, why don't we start off with a bit about you and what you do at the museum? So I'm a planetary science PhD student at the museum, which means I'm taking a research project. At the end of a few years, um, I'll graduate with my PhD. Um, and uh, so what, what sort of things are you looking at in your PhD research? So I work on um, some instruments for an upcoming mission called ExMars that I'll tell you a little bit more about later. So I'm looking at the different ways that we can use light to find out what exists on other planets and search for life. And so if we're looking more specifically at Mars, we should probably start off with a little bit of background information just so that we're all starting on the same page when it comes to this planet. So what is Mars? So. Mars is one of the other rocky terrestrial planets. It's the next planet out from the sun from Earth. Uh, we think at one point in its history, it was quite similar to an early Earth, but the two planets diverged massively um, at some point in history. And Mars is now pretty cold, pretty barren. It's got really high radiation on the surface and it's pretty un inhospitable to life as we know it and as we are today. So what's so inhospitable about it? I mean, it's, you know, it's a rocky planet. It's a similar distance from the sun. Uh, what's so different between, what are the big differences between Mars and Earth? So obviously so this we, is pretty inhospitable. Yeah, so it's it's got solid um, ground, which is a great start, um, but it's it has a few issues which actually stem from the same, the same thing. So Mars at some point in its history lost its magnetic field, so it wasn't able to continue shielding from the sun's radiation the way the Earth can with its um, magnetic, field, magnetic field and its um, atmosphere. So once it lost its magnetic field, it started losing its atmosphere, which meant the temperature plummeted and the surface is really highly irradiated. So us without a space a spacesuit or some sort of hab unit to protect us, we wouldn't last very long on the surface. So I think that leads us really well into some questions that were already pouring in from, uh, from oh, some cool. of our viewers. So we've got a question from one of our YouTube viewers who's asking, uh, so, you know, Mars is, is different from Earth now, but at some point in the past, were they similar? Yeah, we, we think that an early Earth and an early Mars were very similar. And it's actually one of the good rationales to be studying Mars because the Earth has changed a lot um, in, in its history. And because our planet has volcanism and things like that, it's always refreshing the surface. So there actually might be secrets about Earth's history locked into um, Mars as we, as we see it today. And I've also, I think you've already uh, sort of started covering this answer, but... Um, uh, Hannah, one of our other viewers, has asked, would it be possible for humans to survive on Mars? It's technically possible, but it would be very difficult. So it's all going to be easier just to live on Earth and correct the things that are happening on Earth than it would be to go to Mars. There's a lot more risk and a lot more issues involved. Um, so things like we would need oxygen, we'd have to take it with us or we'd have to find a way of farming it. Um, we need something to protect us from the radiation, we need something to protect us from the cold. So it is possible. But to live there long term, it's, it's a, there's a lot that would have to go into that sort of that building um, a hab unit that we could live in. And then we'd have to start trying to grow food on Mars, which is really difficult. So a lot of that would have to come from Earth. So, yes, we can definitely. When is a whole other question. Sure. And, and this fascination, this relationship with Mars, it's not new. It's been going on for hundreds of years. Right. We've been even before we could send things there. We've been looking at it from Earth. So I think we've got an image of, of what Mars looks like from Earth. Um, yeah, so. You know, we've had some pretty interesting interpretations of what we see from Earth. Yeah, absolutely. So one of, the, one of the reasons that Mars has been so well studied and looked at so much is because it's close to Earth, same way the moon is, but sometimes you can actually see it. And if this is with um, an amateur telescope, so 
even with a fairly low resolution telescope, you can still see the ice caps, uh, the difference in the color, the topography and stuff like that. So that's, that's kind of one of the reasons it's very accessible on a kind of um, lower end of like astronomy telescopes and things like that. And it's meant that people throughout for the last few hundred years have been looking up to the stars and kind of trying to figure out what's going on in this, in this alien planet. And there was some pretty, well, some pretty influential early in, in interpretations of some uh, observations from Mars that have shaped a lot of the early ways that we thought and looked at Mars. Um, what are we looking at here? So this is um, a map drawn by Scaffarelli, I believe. So in the 1800s, quite a few people were using amateur telescopes or um, astronomy telescopes to look at Mars. And a few people, separately, a few people did see what they called canali or canals on Mars, all in different places and none of them matched to each other, but that's a, that's a separate thing. So it kind of started the fever of life on Mars as we know it today. People thought that these might be an ancient engineering system or they might be trying to bring water down from the poles to a drying planet and these canals were how they were doing it. So it started the kind of mass excitement that there might be life on Mars way back in the 1800s, which has really continued on today. Yeah, because a lot of the time when people think or speak about life on other planets or aliens coming to Earth, you know, one of the default references is we'll say, oh, Martians, or Martians, yeah. is there life on Mars, or Mars attacks, or, you know. Um, but what were we actually seeing um, when, we were, when they were looking at those images? Was it so, were seeing things on the surface of Mars? Were they built by life forms, or was it something else? Unfortunately not. So this is in a period of astronomy before we had photographic um, applications onto your telescope so we could take exactly what the telescope was seeing. And it's actually an optical illusion within the eye um, of the astronomers that were looking. So fortunately, not doesn't exist, which is a real shame, but um, we know better now. So that's Well, I guess that that, you know, that explains why they they were all so different, all the different. Yeah, these absolutely. They were all just from different eyes. Yeah. <laughs> so moving on from just kind of looking at it from Earth. It's only in the last, you know, few few decades that we've actually been sending missions to or past Mars. And obviously, I guess the early ones were less successful than the new ones. Yeah, there's there've been quite a few sent in the direction or to Mars, and not all of them have been successful because space travel is really difficult. Inherently it's a lot of risk. But in fairness, like average is up as time goes on, which is what you would want. Um, but so I think the 64 was the first time that we had a mission to Mars that was kind of successful and we got some, well, it was a flyby, but we got some, we got some images back. Um, so this, so this was the, the Mariner Mars, probe, right? Yeah, which took some awesome images of the Martian surface on its flyby, which revolutionized how we understand Mars, because up to this point, people still thought there might be canals there. And this must have been a real kind of sea change moment in, in how we look at the planet. Absolutely really had to reassess everything that we thought we knew. The 60s were an amazing time for space exploration in general, and it's obviously dominated by um, things like the, the space race and landing on the moon, which is fair enough. Um, but it brought back, it was the first kind of tangible evidence of that surface, and that, that is really awesome. And then, you know, as part of the space race, we had the first successful landing on the moon, which is the, the Soviet probe, uh, Mars 3. But what the probe that we're going to talk about next is something that brought back some really iconic images and it was a, a an american nasa probe um the viking yeah. Probe. yeah so the viking landers are actually really really cool they they kind of saw the first um like reducing chemistry which we didn't know if it was um the cause of life or if it was abiotic so it gave us some really like a nice little spur into like if life could be living there um which is really cool it also got some pretty amazing um images back which again stirred that fever of is there life on mars so you might have heard of a, an image called the face on Mars, um, which is pretty iconic. So if you look at the kind of top of this image in the center, I'm quite convinced that they're like, it's quite convincing that that looks like a face. And people were stirred up as whether or not it was like an ancient Martian being who was buried when under was the this? sand. So this was in the 80s, I believe. Okay. Um, so people were like, it, it started that forever now. So it could be an ancient alien buried under the sand that was massive. It could be, um, a structure built to a deity or, or something like that, which is really exciting. Unfortunately, a couple of decades later, we got some better instruments on its way to Mars. We got some higher resolution data. And that's actually what that landform looks like. So 
not really a face, bit of a shame, um, but like it's it's kind I mean, of incredible. Like, it's about twenty years apart, and that's the that's the difference in resolution, the improvement in our instruments and our ability in only two decades. And obviously, it's nice to get <clears throat> sorry, it's nice to get better images and and have more precise data. At the same time, it's a little bit disappointing that it wasn't a giant buried. Yeah, under like that. That would be really something. cool. That'd be really yeah. cool. But um, as these instruments progress, as everything gets better, we get closer and closer to like finding real concrete evidence of something like life on Mars or even getting people on Mars, which I think is the only way to go. Well, yeah, I think this is going to be a, a queue of people who want to go and explore yeah. this time. Um, but, you know, it's one thing getting images from Earth or getting images from orbiters, but actually there's nothing that beats actually getting images from on the surface. And for that, nowadays we tend to use rovers, right? Yeah. So. Mars has had a, a pretty successful run of different rovers on the surface. This one's Curiosity. This is the first selfie ever taken on Mars, um, which I'm, I'm sure everybody will have seen. Um, and Curiosity's done some amazing things on its time on the red planet. Um, it's been looking for, so its kind of mission uh, stance was follow the water, because life as we know it needs water to evolve. Um, and Curiosity's been doing that across the Martian surface, and it's really, really awesome. It finds some of the first evidence of organic compounds that we're made of, um, which is all really exciting. I have a question about this selfie. Mm -hmm. Normally, when you see a selfie, you can see an arm or, you know, at worst, a stick. Um, why can't we see anything connecting the camera to the rover here? So it's a good question. There's actually the way um, the rover takes images at the end of its arm, it has a camera. And all of it, well, not all, but most of the images that you'll see coming back from Mars are actually lots and lots of pictures all stitched together. So what it's done, it's moved its arm around, taken lots of pictures all around itself, and those are put back together. And what happens frame to frame is that arm moves, so it doesn't get like registered into the into the whole image. So you kind of are looking at all the bits around it that get stuck back together. Okay, so it just edited out its own arm. That's pretty handy. Kinda, yeah. <laughs> I think now's a really good point to go to some some viewer questions about Mars itself as a planet. Um, so we've had some questions about. Uh, what the atmosphere and gravity is like on Mars? So the atmosphere is very thin. I can't give you an exact thickness, um, but it's mostly CO2. They think there's methane and things as well. We don't know how much, and that's that's a big science question we're trying to answer. But it's very, very thin. So our atmosphere um, manages to kind of re re deflect, essentially, anything really dangerous from the sun that's coming at us. And Mars doesn't have enough to do it, which actually makes it really difficult to land on Mars as well, because we have very little atmosphere just lower parachutes down so it's like another thing we have to think about um when we go to mars the gravity is about a third i think of earth so like you might be able to jump over a car instead of going around to the passenger side well you know that make, I, uh, what I'm doing. I was gonna say that yeah. make martian cop movies a lot more interesting as they slide across the <laughs> but yeah but just keep gravity. going yeah um, and a viewer called finley has asked um What's the what's the geology of Mars like? Is it like Earth, where there's you know like a, a crust and then mantle and core in the middle? So yeah, well at one point it had a more active kind of Earth-like geology, but we think um, the core of Mars solidified and cooled, and that's why it doesn't have the same magnetic field that the Earth does. So it still is present; it's just kind of a little bit dead and a little bit inactive now. Um, and one more question from our viewers before we go into the next bit of content, and actually this leads in really, really nicely. Um, a couple of our viewers, uh, I think Felix and Julie, have asked how many rovers and, and landers and, and stuff like that, how many robots have we sent to Mars already? In total, um, I'm not sure exactly how many have been to Mars, but including flybys, it's about 40 to 50. Right now, we have six um, orbiters in orbit around Mars. There's another one that should be launching any day now. Um, we have the Opportunity rover, which is sadly out of commission at the moment, and we have Curiosity. We also have Insight now, so it's looking into the Martian surface, it's looking for Mars quakes. It's trying to figure out, answer those geology questions about how active the planet is and what's going on under the surface. Um, and we have, there's three more missions um, heading out to Mars this summer, and then the one I work on will be heading out in two years as well. So it's, it's getting pretty busy. So on the subject of um, the mission launching in a couple of years that you're working on, Let's let's go into that. What's it called? Yeah. What what's so, what's the point? Why are you why are you trying to learn from this mission? So XMR is 
2022, as it's called, is looking for signs of past or present life on the red planet. It's actually a linking mission with the Trace Gas Orbiter that's already in orbit, started orbit in 2016, that's looking at the Martian atmosphere. And what this rover and what this mission is trying to do is find out if we ever had life on Mars. So I work in some of the instruments at the top of the um, kind of head of the rover, so I'll tell you about them in a little bit. But one of the really cool things about ExoMars is that black box on the front. So that's a two meter drill. It's going to go down into the Martian surface, get past the radiation barrier. So that really harsh radiation on the surface. So hopefully we might find evidence of living life or we might find evidence of past life that's fossilized and things like that. Oh, because the either the life or the evidence of life that's in the first couple of meters might have been kind of blasted by this. Yeah, it can be destroyed by the radiation. I guess because without a thick atmosphere and without a strong magnetic field, then it's not protected. It's completely open to, to everything the sun's throwing out. And our sun is pretty active. Um, you should go look at solar flares and coronal mass ejections from the sun. Some really cool videos. Um, it's really cool. There we go. It's a YouTube rabbit hole to go on after this talk. Yeah, so oh my God, it is. <laughs> got some good stuff coming up. So, uh, so th this mission, it's looking for signs of existent or, or past life, but... Where is it looking for them and how is it searching for Because, you know, it's it's looking on a whole planet. Um, yeah. A needle in a haystack? Like a little bit. So there's there's a few issues with landing on Mars. You have to have um, something that's low enough so that there's enough atmosphere to slow it down. We're doing a solar power mission, so we have to be somewhere kind of equatorial that's going to give us enough power for the rover. So out of the entirety of Mars, you actually don't have a lot of it that is currently that we're currently able to land on. And then once you've kind of got through all those engineering issues, you want to find something that's interesting. So we're going to land at Oxyoplanum. Uh, this is this image that you can see is uh, the background is something called thermal infrared. And then those colored bits, um, that encompasses kind of all of where the rover might land. So all the colors refer to different minerals, different things of interest, but we could literally land anywhere. So about 99% confident we'll land in the red and we're about 95% confident we'll land within the black. So it's a pretty big space, but it's over 100 kilometers, so we can actually land anywhere in there. And then we have to, once we land, we have to figure out what cool and what's interesting around us. And I think that's the part that you're working on, right? How to yeah. identify the interesting parts. Yeah. So, so what does your project entail? You're working on, you said you were working on kind of the, the head. Yes. Yeah. So uh, this, is, this is me in the lab at the museum, actually, taking some data. So what I do is I look at the way light interacts with different materials. And I use that to find out how we identify them on other planets. And that's called spectroscopy. And we're looking at spectra. So the, uh, these instruments that you can see are kind of copies of the, the missions that are going to fly to Mars. So we've got PanCam, which is the head of the rover. On either side, we have these two eyes. So that's the camera on either side um, with a filter wheel in front of it. So we can look at different wavelengths and different colors. Um, and those, just like we do, it sees in 3D because it has two different eyes to kind of reconstruct everything around it. It's pretty cool because the rover should be able to drive itself using that. Pretty awesome. Uh, between those, we also have something called the high resolution camera, um, which takes really, really fine detail images somewhere inside what PanCam sees. There's actually another one, but you can't see it um, in this image called ISEM, which looks, takes tiny little spots, but takes much more, um, sorry, more, longer wavelengths out into infrared that we can't really see. Wow, so it's it's got two <laughs> that it uses to survey its environment. And then imagine having a third eye in between the others that you could take hyper detailed images with. That'd Super be really useful, cool, right? Actually. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned these filter wheels. Yes. What are these filters for? So essentially what they do, they block out part of the wavelength spectrum. So we can only see very select wavelengths. And then what we do is we put all of them back together to make a kind of curved line that shows us what the spectrum, what the, the reflectance is all across the wavelength. So they see in color the same way we do with red, green, and blue, but then they also have some other science filters. So each eye has six um, geology filters that are gonna tell us about the environment, and then it has some ones to look at the sun and the atmosphere as well. So to kind of help explain that a little bit, um, there's, we have a graph here. So these so colors vaguely, sorry. So along here, we've got uh, the wavelength of light uh, is how kind of how long the, the light waves are. And so on the- yep left we've got really short waves which is uh so 440 nanometers is kind of the limit of what we can see in terms of how blue we can see yeah and as it gets redder and redder and redder we get to about what 750 and then yep. that's as far red as we can see and after yep. that so we have, infrared it's called yes so infrared's kind of like heat radiation so actually of the whole electromagnetic spectrum we can see a very small portion of it and what these 
instruments and these rovers do is help us see way beyond what our eyes can do. So what, how, what's that useful for? So the, the way kind of the way we use spectra, so everybody has individual fingerprints. Spectra is like the fingerprint of different minerals. So if we can, can we can build back up what its spectra looks like in all these different filters, we can start to figure out what things exist on Mars and compare it to stuff on Earth, and then we can figure out what it is. So I have a really good picture of um, this is Tissant. It's one of the museums meteorites. You might have seen it. It's usually in the vault. It's um, about this big, this big, um, and it's a, an awesome an awesome meteorite that we have. So I have been ta taking some images of this with our instruments. So you'll see uh, a few gray images and that's going through all of the filters. And the kind of key thing to look at, that target on the right, see how that changes? That's the reflectance of all of those colors at different wavelengths. So that helps us put, um, kind of connect the dots and put back all the pieces and create a spectra, uh, a spectrum for us to analyze. And so uh, does does that mean that different materials and different chemicals will reflect different amounts of each of those 12 filters? Yes, absolutely. It can be a little so, bit difficult to discern what's what, but yes. So what happens when you put that information back together? How do you use it? So the really cool thing about PanCam is it has, it takes a whole picture of an entire scene and then it takes all these filters as well. So we can take our spectra, our new information and put it across the entire picture. So this is a map, uh, kind of mapping thing that we do on, on our data. So if you look at all of the pink bits, I've told it to tell me if something has one feature and call it red, one feature and call it blue, and one feature and call it green. So everything that's pink is a mixture of that red and blue. So it tells me that the red and blue are similar and the green is quite different, which we might not be able to tell straight away because those are, those are colors and wavelengths that our eyes can't detect. And you can ask the computer to uh, to identify different features in that spectrum, right? So yes. when you're looking for, you can ask the computer to pick it out. So uh, here's a great image, actually. Why don't you walk us through this from left to right? So, where, so this, this wasn't from Mars, was it? Because I can see some trees. Yeah, unfortunately not. So this is actually in Spain. So when we're preparing for missions, we have to do a lot of practicing. Um, and it's the same for the rover. What what happens is it gets sent out to Spain or the Atacama or somewhere like that. Um, and we, all the scientists basically pretend that we're on mission and it's very serious. Um, so this is actually an image that we took during those trials. So on the left hand side is just the, the data that comes back from the rover put together into color. In the middle, I've got a map over it that kind of accentuates the difference in all the spectra. So you can see in that ridge, there's some purple bits, there's some really yellow bits. And that tells me that there's something spectrally going on there that I couldn't see in the first image with just my eye. Um, and then the right map, if you see those really, really bright blue bits, that's something else I've asked it to look for. So I can tell straight away that something I'm interested in is um, kind of exists in that really bright blue band at the top of the ridge there. So I guess that makes it easier than, you know, rather than looking at the, the kind of big multicolored uh, kind of kaleidoscope of an image there that tells you a lot of information about different things, you can pick out one feature that you want the, the computer to identify for you. Yeah, so absolutely. So identifying in that picture on the right? That's hematite. So hematite can form in the presence of water, so that's quite interesting. Um, this picture was taken in Spain, so that's, that's fairly reasonable. We think there probably was water in Spain at some point. Um, but on Mars, that's really interesting because then we could go and investigate that ridge a little bit more and see if that's maybe a good place to drill. Um, and we've had a question from one of our viewers, Renardo, who's asking, um, does the Martian atmosphere or the Earth atmosphere when you're testing it interfere with uh, how the light waves are transmitted and absorbed? And, and does that affect your data? How do you deal with that? Yeah, that's a great question. So it does. Um, the way light scatters in the atmosphere can change a lot of things about this, what we see. But we have a calibration target on board and we know exactly what it looks like in a totally clean environment with um, totally uniform light on Earth. And what we do we just we figure out how different they are and how to make them the same and we do that to our data as well so we can kind of correct out the any issues because of lighting and we have to do that when we're in the field here as well it's a really good question it's great to have a little reference thing there so yeah <laughs> going back to the the uh the, the analysis of the terrain and stuff what sort of things are you looking for you know once you've got all these powerful analysis uh and these kind of amazing tools and, and instruments. What are you looking for on, on, on the surface of Mars? 
So with all the different instruments, there's, there's a number of things. We're looking for clays and hydrated minerals, so things that contain water or have contained water. So that's maybe a good place to look for life. Looking for organic molecules and compounds. Um, in particular, um, I'm quite interested in looking for meteorites on Mars. So you've probably seen meteorites at the museum. Um, this is actually a museum sample. Um, it's a really, really huge iron meteorite, really, really heavy. And you can see that it's kind of different colors across the surface and it's weathered, um, and that's really interesting. And we didn't talk about Opportunity too much before, but Opportunity was um, an amazing mission to Mars that uh, was supposed to last three months, ended up lasting 14 years, did some really ama amazing science, found evidence of liquid water, uh, or sorry, water on the surface. Um, and she actually found um, an iron meteorite on Mars called Block Island. So That's beautiful. We, yeah, it's really awesome, isn't it? Um, so if we study the meteorites that we have in the museum, we can understand the ones on Mars a lot better. And we can do things like trace climate records, look at the um, how the, the history has changed, how the atmosphere must have changed. Cause so for something this big, this is like 60 centimetres across, the atmosphere must have been a lot thicker to stop it breaking up. So that's that's really cool. Uh, it tells us a lot about the history of Mars without us even having to bring a sample back just from these these kind of amazing samples. And this is only this is only one thing that we can look at. We also have, so this is my favourite bit, um, we also have things called chondrites. So they've got some organic, um, they're organic meteorites. And in the Nullarbors in Australia, in the desert, they actually weather in a really cool way. They weather from the inside to the outside, which means if Mars had life, they could actually live inside these little meteorites, which would be amazing. So they get hollowed out. How did yeah, the so big lump of space rock, when it lands in the middle of Australia, get hollowed out from the inside? So with the variation in heating and things like that, they can crack, um, which makes little gaps. And then if water or things like that could get in, they just start to kind of... Um, essentially just hollow out and there's tons of really reducing chemistry in there that's perfect for life to get started um this is actually a really another really cool meteorite um from museum this one's called risha and see all those really cool lines on it so if you look really close um what's actually happened it's weathered so much it's been destroyed by wind and water and rain um but you can actually see the interior of the meteorite from the outside there that's it that's its fidman staffen pattern which is, which is pretty awesome Wow. So, and, and that's, do we know where that meteorite came from? Did that come from Mars? Or? No. So this is just an iron meteorite, um, but it's one of the ones that I'm using to help me understand what meteorites on Mars will look like and then develop those maps. So it's super easy to find them. So just like you have that, um, those color reference targets to calibrate your images against the kind of the, the Martian light, you have almost reference meteorites here on earth to compare. Yeah the martian ones too That's yeah really so we're yeah it's really cool and it's hopefully we'll get to the point where we can tell the computer that we want to search for x y and z types of meteorites and it'll just give us back a bunch of images and highlight them for us that's hopefully where my my work will lead will lead me so um we've got a couple of questions from our viewers about um about some about the mission and about some of your work um so uh Anne and lewis um have asked the questions that i think we can put together is how long do these rovers take to build and prepare generally? And how long does it take to get to Mars once you build them? So it, it depends a lot on if what you're doing is really new. So it took a lot of time to develop the really big two meter drill on ExoMars because it's a really ambitious project. And so ExoMars has been in development for decades now. It's had a lot of um, redesign over the years. So it's been being planned for a very long time. There's an orbiter mission um, from United Arab Emirates, which I think takes six years to kind of to build. So it just depends on what exactly you want to do and how different that is to what we've done before. So anywhere from like 30 years to a year is kind of is quite reasonable. We're actually getting to Mars. That's a really good question. So I said earlier that X Mars is going to launch in 2022 instead of 2020. So we have um, every two years. It's when Mars and Earth are close enough that it's easier to send a rover in between the two. So every two years, if we miss our window, we have to wait for the next one, which is a bit of a shame, but like, it's the best way to send them. So it'll take oh, about because, nine months. Is that because of uh, how the orbits around the sun of Earth and Mars kind of sync up? Yeah. So the worst time to send it would be when the Earth is on one side of the sun and Mars is on the other. Uh, that would be super difficult to get it right through the middle of the sun. Um, so we have to wait till they're quite close um, and it just makes it a lot easier and a lot safer for us to send them. 
And XMRs will take about nine months, and so will um, NASA Perseverance take about nine months once we launch off of Earth to, to land on Mars. And I guess in terms of uh, preparing the mission, is it is it harder and therefore more labour intensive to to build something that's going to land, especially something that's going to move around on the surface, as compared to something that's just going to kind of orbit or fly past? It, it depends. So the getting things into orbit is still quite difficult um, because we have to know exactly all the, how the math will work out with all the planets in our solar system, which is quite complicated. But there's an extra kind of difficulty we have with landing on the surface of Mars. Because um, the atmosphere is really thin, we have to make sure there's enough atmosphere to pull our parachutes down, or we have to look at using um, a kind of sky crane the way NASA Curiosity was landed. So it, there's just there's more to think about, but it, they're still both very difficult. And that thing about the gravity and the uh, and the atmosphere um, being both being kind of less than here on Earth, how does that affect parachutes? Because if it's being pulled down less hard by less gravity, but it's being slowed down less because the atmosphere. So it's a good question. Do you when, need extra um, big parachutes? So yes and no. We actually have a two-stage parachute system with XMR, so it's got one supersonic and one subsonic. So that's faster than the speed of sound and then slower than the speed of sound. So it's going to deploy more than one to help it slow down. But as it kind of comes into, into Mars's atmosphere, it's got all of the speed, the, um, all of the velocity that it left Earth with, basically. So it's got to slow all of that down. It had to catch up with Mars, which took nine months. So it's going pretty fast. Um, so it's kind of a balance between, it's a balance between the two. And um, Will is asking, once, you know, once we've done enough... Uh, like robotic missions and rovers and stuff when do you think it might be possible or likely for humans to be able to travel to mars it's a really good question so i'm hoping that it's within the next few decades because i'd really like to go um but it's very difficult so like i said the nine month transfer to mars from earth there's a long time for for people to be in kind of low gravity so we have to look at that which is quite difficult to look at how we get people back um, which is even more difficult. So getting to the planet is the, one of the hardest parts. You need so much energy to escape um, escape the gravitational pull. And even though Mars is a much lower gravitational pull, it still has one. So we have to send people with enough resources that they can stay, live for a while, and still be able to come back. Because the idea of changing Mars enough that it's Earth-like would take hundreds, if not thousands of years. So I want to stay in the next few decades, but I, I can't tell you for sure. Well, on the subject of being able to stay there for a bit to do some work, would we have to bring food or would we be able to maybe grow food? So um, you might have seen that film and read the book, The Martian, where uh, yeah. Damon grows potatoes in his own poo. Uh, yeah. How do you perceive that as a prospect? So growing, growing food on Mars is very difficult. It's actually some pretty novel ways that we're looking at of overcoming the other issues. So building on Mars to shield us from radiation. If we use the Mars' own soil, that's one way that we can take less building material um, and still kind of get the full effect of the shielding from radiation. Starting to warm the planet is, is quite difficult, but you could use something like a solar sail. So basically you redirect the sunlight and start trying to melt the, melt the ice caps of Mars. But it's, that's a really, really big and ambitious um, kind of goal. But we can't really be growing anything on the surface until we have liquid water. We won't have liquid water till the atmosphere, uh, till the planet warms up a little bit, and the planet won't warm up until we have more of an atmosphere. So there's a lot, a lot to think about for long term us living on a different planet. And I guess, for sure. and I guess that you know that also raises the issue of, is it our right to go and go to another planet, start melting the ice caps, start changing it to be some somewhere we would want to live? I mean, who gets really that responsibility? Absolutely, it's a really, really complex question because the way people see space and the monetization of space, I think, can be quite damaging. So, how do we, until we we actually behave as one kind of civilization with the same goals and the and the same respect for everybody, there's kind of no way to make sure that everyone is treated fairly in in that conversation. There's actually a whole branch of space um, law that looks at planetary protection. So. We're obviously, we're hoping we find life on other planets, but if a life exists on other planets, we need to be very, very careful about how we, how we go there, how we land, how we excavate and things like that. So our dream is to find life 
on a different planet. But if we find life, we have to be very careful that we don't contaminate it or ruin its biosphere or anything like that. So it's, it's just really complex. Space ethics, space law. I mean, if you put space before anything, it becomes even cooler. Yeah, um, that's fair. We've got a question from one of our viewers, Patrick, who's asked about how you got to where you are. Like, what subjects do you study? What sort of things are important if you want to get to a position where you can work on Mars rovers? So it's actually maybe the best thing is to tell you exactly how I did it because there's so much variety in the people that work on these missions and, and do this stuff. When I was at school, I absolutely loved physics and astronomy. It was like my favorite thing. I used to like lie outside and stare at the stars um, for basically my entire childhood. Um, it was it was something I was really, really interested in. And I loved doing physics and things like that. So when I went to university, I studied astrophysics. It was what I was interested in. But there's just, there's masses of, um, of different ways to get into the space industry. So we have, we need geologists to understand the surface of the planet and the way it looks and what that means. We need biologists for looking for life, how life can exist in these environments and astrobiology. Um, we need chemists, we need mathematicians. It's so massively varied that no matter what you're interested in and what you do, if you want to end up in space, there is kind of, there's always a kind of path to it. It's, it's really not very linear. Um, and I think that's a really cool thing about planetary science and space science because we need everyone's input. We need everyone's help. And it, you can't really, one, one subject of expertise isn't going to be enough. And like you mentioned in that answer to the previous question, as well as having the technical expertise, we also need to frame that in a kind of uh, ethical and societal understanding as well. Because, you know, even if we can reliably get people to Mars, if we land there and we, uh, and, and we don't act in a responsible way or if we, we have different priorities from each other, then... No, that could end badly. Yeah, like there's a, a pretty terrible history of the way we've treated people and um, communities like on Earth, and we don't need to have that. Like that's not that has no part in our future. So I think it's it's a really complex because some some places when they're exploring the solar system behave in a very um, us and me mentality. And like I, the way I view space exploration, any of this is absolutely for everyone. Even if you're not doing the work on it, it's for everyone, and it's for the benefit of everyone and the joy of everyone. And I think framing all of the planetary exploration that we ever do in that way is really important. Yeah. And, and, and let's not go to Mars and ruin it too. And in terms of, yeah, in terms of what you said about kind of um, how, we, how we frame things and how we view things, what do you think about what certain figures have said about using Mars as kind of a backup Earth or an Earth 2 in case we ruin this one? So... We've done a lot. We, there's a lot of destruction that we've done to the Earth because of our habits and the way that we behave. But it's never going to be easier to move to a different place in our solar system and create an environment that we can thrive in than it would be to just make the necessary changes now. I really don't like the backup Earth um, kind of idea at all because it's as if we're forsaking the planet that gave us life. And I just don't think that's OK. <laughs> I mean... I, I agree. And I think that uh, it, it, we need to, there's a lot of lessons we need, we can learn from mistakes we've made in the past. Absolutely. Like, until we've learned them, is it particularly responsible for us to go and make those exact same mistakes on a totally new planet? Especially I think we have, a, we have some time before, before hopefully that will be, <laughs> those things will happen. But Well, ethicists, go and uh, study space ethics and <laughs> help us solve yeah. these it's actually really interesting, yeah. Well, there's actually a council called SETI who they're the um, they're looking for the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, which is like an amazing organisation if you're interested in that sort of thing to go kind of look at. At SETI, S E T I. Yes, SETI. All right, so guys, after the after the talk, maybe go down that rabbit hole as well. On yes. The <laughs> Sorry, I'm just well, like throwing rabbit holes out. <laughs> no, I mean everyone loves uh, an avenue to explore down. And I think actually that brings us to a quite nice end to our, our discussion. Um, thank you so much, Sarah. I've really enjoyed it. I've learned a lot. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, no problem at all. And thank you all at home as well for joining us. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. Please do join us again for more Nature Live shows, uh, 12 on Tuesdays and 10.30 a.m. on Fridays. Keep an eye on our social media channels as well. You can find us on Facebook, Insta, Twitter, and YouTube as well as nhm.ac.uk.
Until next time, that was Sarah Matagian. I'm Khalil Thurloway, and this has been Nature Live. Goodbye. Mm-hmm.